These are some responses to the questions that I asked you about Ta-Nehisi Coates' article, The Case for Reparations. So what I've done is I've just included some of your classmates' responses and I found some quotations from the text that help us to answer some of these questions. If you want more details, uh, if you want more information on how I would respond, uh, go to the page itself um, and read what I've written there. I'm just going to do kind of a brief overview right now. So one of the questions I asked you was, why might Coates begin his essay with three quotes? So we have a quote from the Bible from Deuteronomy, we have a quote from the philosopher John Locke, and we have a quote from an anonymous writer. What is the purpose of these epigraphs? So epigraph or before or outer writing is some sort of quote uh, that you see before a novel or before an article. And usually that quote, in this case it's three quotes, gives us some clue as to what the text is going to be about or hints at some sort of theme. So you might have noticed that all three of these quotes have to do with reparations in some way. Remember that in English 103, we're focused on what the argument actually is, but we're equally focused on how the writer or the rhetorician, in this case Coates, who's a professional writer and who has won many awards uh, for this piece, um, how he's using certain rhetorical techniques and strategies, how he's making the argument in addition to what the argument is. So both of those things are really important. So uh, the first quote is a quote from Deuteronomy, which is the fifth book of the Torah or the fifth book of the Bible's Old Testament. And one point that a classmate brought up is that if the Bible has been used to justify slavery, which unfortunately it has been used uh, in that way, uh, perhaps it's being used here to justify reparations, right? Uh, this quote has a certain authority after uh, to people who uh, respect the Bible after all. Uh, it's a quotation or it's um, um, a, a command from the Lord uh, to provide reparation. So it begins the essay with an authority, right? Uh, so people who might not be inclined to agree with the concept of reparations uh, are people who don't even want to study the topic of reparations right from the right off the bat when they're given a quotation from the Bible that might appeal to some readers. Uh, we also have a quotation from John Locke's second treatise. Uh, if you know anything about John Locke, you might know that many of his ideas inspired um, our um, American revolutionaries. So this might be an appeal to patriotic Americans. So uh, while the first quote might appeal to some people, the second quote, the reference to philosopher John Locke, might appeal to people who are patriotic. And actually Coates does this a lot, at least in my view, throughout the essay. He appeals to our patriotic patriotism, but in a very different way. And he says that in order to be truly patriotic, not this a la carte or pick and choose patriotism, but to be truly patriotic, we have to um, reckon with our past. We have to really explore uh, and take responsibility for our past. So it's a different type of patri patriotism than some people might be used to. And then the last quote is from an anonymous writer. It's worth noting that the quote is from 1861. So some students have referenced that it could be the voice of a slave. Um, 1861 was the beginning of the Civil War. So this quotation would be uh, at least a few years before the Emancipation, Emancipation Proclamation and then um, Juneteenth. So it might be that we go from the Bible to John Locke to a quotation from a person ha who has been enslaved or um, at least at the very least oppressed. Uh, that order might be meaningful, right? Uh, maybe it's saving uh, the voice of of the, the first person account for last. Uh, maybe it's working our way down from the most um, frequently cited authority figure, the Bible, down to an individual. And it's interesting that there's no name, right? It's a quotation from an anonymous source. Um, Coates made a point in an interview that I can link on this page that um, one of the reasons why um, people might have started talking about reparations so much more after he wrote this piece in 2014, people have been discussing reparations uh, forever, as Coates mentioned several times throughout his essay, but after this piece was published, uh, it entered the conversation again. Um, one of the reasons Coates says might be that it was published in the Atlantic and he says fairly or unfairly the Atlantic has a certain prestige it's considered a serious magazine so uh, the idea is that perhaps the publication venue or the forum where it was published, the Atlantic Magazine, helped launch it into the national conversation rightly, fairly or unfairly. 
Section two is about housing discrimination rather than slavery itself. Why does Coates begin his essay with a lengthy discussion of a still living 91 year old man's experiences? So he has several paragraphs and he really begins his piece with the story of Clyde Ross. And if we view it on the website itself, we get to uh, watch the video and get this really moving and powerful first person account. Of course, in this class, you always want to be thinking about how the writer appeals to pathos and logos and ethos. I think this example of Clyde Ross really blends all three of those rhetorical appeals. So perhaps he does this to uh, begin with um, an example of somebody seeking reparations in 1968. Uh, I think he also begins with someone who is still alive today to address the counter argument or to plant a naysayer before a reader has a chance to object and say something like, well, wait a minute, slavery has been over for a long time. He says, well, here is an example of somebody who was denied wealth that he had earned. So he gives an, an example of somebody who is still living. And what's interesting is Clyde Ross uh, was born in Mississippi, then went off to fight in World War II. And then even when he settled in Lawndale, he still faced discrimination. So I think this is a really powerful example that rebuts this idea right off the bat that hey, slavery is over, uh, he says, well, yes, while slavery is over, it would actually it's actually quite easy uh, to find people who have experienced not only the legacy of slavery, but housing discrimination. It also served as a primary source and a testimony, which is all the more powerful. What does Coates mean by elegant racism? Uh, there are several quotations that I think speak to this, but uh, the one that I've highlighted here in green I think is compelling. If you sought to advantage one group of Americans and disadvantage another, you could scarcely choose a more graceful method than housing discrimination. So I think what Coates is saying is that none of this is an accident, right? Um, it's as if every single law or every single practice has been designed to disenfranchise black people. Uh, that's the argument there, at least that's the argument as I see it. And then uh, another passage, this is a quote uh, from an urban studies expert. Instead, the FHA adopted a racial policy that could well have been culled from the Nuremberg laws. So by citing an expert who is saying that um, these laws uh, could have been taken from the Nuremberg laws, which were the laws that were used in Germany uh, that set up the framework for the, the Holocaust that disenfranchised Jewish people and uh, dehumanized them, but they were technically legal. So it set up the framework for the Holocaust. Um, what this quotation, I think, is getting at is that none of this was an accident. This was strategic, uh, designed to advantage certain people and disadvantage other people.